Welcome to Burlington Now. I'm your host, Dee Brockwell, and this week we are with Officer Shante Harris-Stewart. From inside the BPD. Y'all should know me out there. <laughs> We're going to take a few looks at some of our favorite episodes that we've covered throughout the year. First, we're going to cover some of the Burlington Now episodes, and then we're going to cover Inside the BPD favorite episodes. So let's get started. We have the New Leaf Society that's really interested in upgrading the creek and actually turning this beautiful piece of land into an arboretum. And we're going to draw visitors from all over this part of the state to come and visit. And we really want this creek to be an addition, something that's going to attract folks. It's a lot of fun for kids. As a kid, I loved playing in this creek, but we're gonna invite young and old and have something that's really going to restore the creek and be something to be proud of and, and enjoy. There's been several neighborhood meetings. We've had the architects here. We've had the plans rolled out. Folks with the vision have come and talked to folks one-on-one. -on -one. If there's any questions, you know, they've been here to ask. We've had tents set up and actually met on site. I'm here in Willowbrook Park today looking at the creek and how it flows through the park. As you can see, the creek makes an eddy here which is what creeks do. The water ebbs and flows on one side and deposits on another side. But when they do undercut like this, it can create problems for the trees around here and can also create problems for walkways and even the road that's nearby. In this case here, the creek's getting dangerously close to East Willowbrook. It's within about 15 to 20 feet of the road now and in some areas it's probably close as eight feet. As the creek and the water comes in, it undercuts the soil here, it undercuts the roots of trees, and the ground begins to collapse. So every heavy rain, every flood, it just continues to collapse and get closer and closer to the road. The creek is going to be repaired. The erosion will be worked on at the same time that we're gonna eliminate the exotic invasives such as privet. If you drive by in your car, or even walk by, you're gonna look at this big, beautiful oak tree and wonder why would a tree like this have to be taken out? Now from the opposite side of the tree, everything is perfect. You ride by in a car, you don't see any problems. But you come around to this side of the tree and it's really obvious from an arborist point of view that this tree has some, some major faults. Well, when you look at trees, you just can't look at the, the crown of the tree or the top of the tree. They can be very deceptive. Uh, fully leafed out, green, looks healthy, providing beautiful shade. And, lots of homes for wildlife and other animals. But when you start examining trees, you've got to look at the roots, you've got to look at the trunk, you've got to look at the basal area, or down here where the, where the roots go into the ground. And a classic example is what we're looking at today is um, what we call different types of butt rots that get into the roots and get into the, the base of the tree. You can see here where Jeff has put a stick in here. And let's just slip this out. And lo and behold, Look how deep that rod is. That's a good three feet inside, and it's even further inside that tree. But it's already rotted to the point that we can stick a stick in there three feet. And that tells us that this decay is completely encompassed and rotted away the base of this tree. And so you've got to be proactive. When you see things like this, we have to deal with them immediately. And that's what this project is doing. And we've got many trees in this park that are this condition. But fortunately, we're going to plant new ones back. In fact, the New Leaf Society is going to be planting 100 new trees to restore the shade and restore the beauty to this downtown park. We're looking at changing a little bit of parking so we don't have as much on-street parking. It's going to be real family-oriented. I've been working in this park for 36 years, and I know how loved it is and how the neighborhood is enmeshed with this park. It's part of everybody that's lived here and you've had folks that have lived here 50, 60 years. They're looking forward to seeing something beautiful. Since this segment originally aired in March of 2018, the stream restoration portion is nearing completion. Crews have restored the stream path and cleared away brush and trees. 307 new trees and shrubs were recently planted. Construction begins this year on the Arboretum Building, Parking and Paths, and a Veterans Plaza overlooking the park. Beautiful. Whether you 
like to hike, bike, or a walk, the city of Burlington has a long-term widespread plan for the entire city that's just right for you. We're going to speak with the Assistant Director of the Recreation and Parks Department, Lisa Wolf, who will tell us more about where we are in the progress for this plan and what it's going to mean for you, your friends, and your family in connecting the parks, trails, and of course the features within the parks with each other to make it a more enjoyable experience for you and your family. So Lisa, I understand the City Council approved a plan for greenways and for expanding on the trails and hiking areas in our Parks and Recreation Department areas. I know some progress has been made and there's lots more to do. Where are we at with that? Sure, Dee. So the City Council had some of their goals set um, and one of, it was, or one of those important goals was the improved connectivity throughout the city across the board. And by doing that, we took a look at um, do we just develop a comprehensive greenway and bike plan? Are there any things that can be done quicker rather than sooner and later? Um, so what we did is we titled it the Quick Hitter uh, Greenway Trail Improvements, and those are were actually within three different parks, at Fairchild Park, City Park, and then at Springwood Park. I would say at this point, um, City Park is about 95% complete, and Fairchild's about 99% complete. So just some great, real improvements for the communities to be able that live within these communities to be able to walk just within the parks themselves. So we already had, as you can see, paved surfaces here right. um, at the city park, and we're just doing some improvements around the other side of the park. So the bigger plan identifies through um, various community meetings, community input. We had um, a steering committee that helped drive the process. We presented it to the council back um, last, the end of last summer. Uh, they endorsed it and we're moving forward and um, one of the first initiatives in the big Greenway plan is the Front Street Connector, which will be a connector piece of a multi-use trail from Elon University, helping us to get to the downtown area eventually. And we have a lot of, um, we have some partners in that first phase of the Greenway. Impact Alamance was a huge contributing partner and um, has taken an active role within our Greenway um, trail developments. Elon University and the town of Elon with the city of Burlington. So it's great to have these partners at the table to start this and have the you know the kickoff project going. So um, and as you know as budget allows, as community you know comes to the table with any interest in partnerships, we certainly welcome that. Um, but we can move the plan along as you know funding becomes allocated. So. I know some outlying areas, some outlying cities have already had some greenway areas installed and, and some of the people in our community travel to those areas. So now they're starting to say within our community to enjoy what's here in Burlington. I would think that would be a goal. Um, certainly it's a goal of one of our, you know, of the plan is to get people to be able to communicate and connect across the city overall, and you're correct, a lot of people do go to Greensboro and surrounding areas. Um, the Raleigh, Raleigh area has, you know, extensive Greenway trail system, as does Greensboro. So we're getting there. Um, it's one step at a time, and um, we hope that this first step is going to be the big selling point for the community to be supportive and be able to move forward. Every track has to be at least ADA compliant, um, including slopes of the track or the trails. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see here at City Park, we do have some that are partially paved. Uh, some of the areas within Fairchild Park um, and Springwood Park will be paved and some of them will be like a fine granite surface, so very fine crushed granite finds is what it's titled. And so certainly it's similar to what we have at Davidson Park on our walking track, our city park walking track, but these trails in certain areas will have paved surfaces based on erosion control and then other areas they will be with the, with the gravel surface. So it certainly is a welcoming opportunity for anybody. The trail at Springwood will be complete probably by midsummer this year. Um, and that will surround the whole soccer complex and then come back around and connect to our baseball complex. Well, a lot has been done and so a lot of movement has been made. So we look forward to lots of exciting things coming up. Since this segment originally aired in March of 2018, 98% of the paths have been completed in City Park, Fairchild Park, and Springwood Park. The first two major Greenway segments are slated to begin construction in the spring of 2019. The first of these Greenway segments are located along the Front Street Corridor between Elon University and Briarcliff Road. The second of these segments is the beginning connector between Burlington Animal Shelter and Haw River Trail. Keep an eye out for these exciting new projects. So that was a great look back at some of our favorite episodes. And now we're gonna look at some favorites from inside the BPD. I hope you enjoy.
Go ahead. We're killing a personalized. When you see emergency lights and or hear a siren behind you, stay calm. Activate your turn signal, pull your vehicle to the right and off the travel portion of the highway at the nearest point where it is safe to do so. If there is not an obvious safe place to immediately stop the vehicle, turn on your emergency four-way flashers and reduce your speed by about 10 miles per hour to signal to the officer that you are aware of his or her presence. Continue driving and obey all traffic laws until you reach the nearest safe area to stop your vehicle. If an unmarked car is stopping you and you have a legitimate question or concern as to whether or not you are being stopped by an actual law enforcement officer, you may call 911 to report your name and location in order to verify that an actual law enforcement officer is conducting the traffic stop. After the vehicle stops, the driver should place the vehicle in park, roll down the window, turn off the engine, and silence any electronic devices and or your radio so that the driver can easily communicate with the officer. Do not reach under the seats and do not open the glove compartment and begin searching for your license or registration unless you are asked to do so by the officer. Remain calm and refrain from engaging in sudden or unnecessary movements during the traffic stop. Do not remove your seatbelt unless asked to do so by the officer. Do not exit the vehicle or allow any passengers to exit the vehicle unless instructed to do so by the officer. The driver should place both hands on the steering wheel and instruct any passengers to keep their hands in the position that is clearly visible to the officer at all times. Passengers in the back seat should place their hands on the back of the front seat. Keep your hands in plain view. An officer may approach your vehicle on the driver or passenger side for safety reasons. If it is nighttime, the officer may direct a spotlight at your vehicle once stopped. To assist with visibility, turn on your interior lights as soon as you stop to help the officer see inside your vehicle. If you have a concealed weapon permit, be sure to inform the officer of that fact. Also, be sure to inform the officer whether or not you have a weapon inside the vehicle. If there is a firearm or other weapon in the vehicle, do not attempt to reach for the weapon. Under state law, any weapon should be in plain view or securely locked away, unless you have the proper permit. If the officer is not in uniform, they will show you their law enforcement credentials or you may ask to see them. During a traffic stop, you can expect there to be another officer arrive on scene, and that officer is basically on location to keep an eye out for any safety hazards, the well-being of the other officer, and also the well-being of the driver of the vehicle and any occupants inside the car. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm Officer Darden with the Burlington Police Department. The officer will usually explain why they stopped you and may ask you questions about your trip. Do you have your driver's license on you? I do. It's in my purse. Okay, where's your purse at? It's right next to me. Okay, that's fine. If you can get your driver's license out for me. Okay. Under state law, you are required to identify yourself and provide your driver's license and registration for the vehicle. Listen carefully to the officer and follow his or her instructions. Give the officer your full attention. If you do not understand an instruction, calmly inform the officer that you do not understand and ask him or her so to repeat or explain their instructions. All right, just sit tight one second for me, okay, ma'am? All right. Do not talk on your cell phone while interacting with the officer during the stop. The officer has to be able to give you and your passengers detailed instructions so you understand what is expected of you. If you receive oh, a I telephone so. call during the traffic okay, stop, no, the officer will tell you whether or not to answer the telephone not. call. All right, you realize North Carolina law requires you to carry your driver's license. I don't think the law says that. Do not argue with the officer. Some traffic stops may result in an arrest. If you disagree, you have your chance to present your case in court. Resisting, delaying, or obstructing a law enforcement officer during a traffic stop is a class two misdemeanor. All right, I'll be right back with you in one second, ma'am. Okay, don't take too long. During a traffic stop, you must remain patient and try not to disrespect the officer. Ma'am, can I get you to step out of the car real quick for me and just step back here and talk to me? When the officer completes their interaction with you, they may issue a warning or a traffic ticket, which may include a fine. The officer will typically explain whatever action is being taken. If you have questions, respectfully ask the officer to clarify. If you disagree with the officer's decision to issue a traffic ticket, do not prolong the contact by arguing with the officer. If you wish to contest the ticket, you will have the opportunity to explain your point of view of what happened in court. Your acceptance and signature on a traffic ticket is not an admission of guilt. If you believe the officer acted inappropriately, document the officer's behavior and report it to the officer's agency in a timely manner. The name of the officer and law enforcement agency will be on the ticket, or you may ask the officer to provide you this information. 
So on this episode of Inside the BPD, I hope you learn everything you need to learn during the traffic stop and you feel educated on exactly what to do. Officer Darton, is there anything that you would like to tell the viewers? Just want to remind everybody just to remember to listen, explain, comply, complain. And if you do have an issue with the way a traffic stop goes or something that happens on a traffic stop, feel free to contact the police department and ask to speak to the on-duty supervisor about what happened. Come on, find it. Find it, show me. Good boy. So I'm standing here with K-9 handler Justin Jolly. Justin, what do you have to go through to become a handler? Uh, to become a handler, I had to submit a uh, letter to my supervisor, my first line supervisor. Um, we had a process that we went through, um, which included an oral board. It also included a physical fitness, um, where we had to demonstrate that we could run a mile uh, within a certain amount of time. We had to do it within 10 minutes. Um, we also had to hold a dog back while the dog was agitated by a decoy and a bite suit. So every year we do a minimum of 192 hours of training. I and mean, the way we get those hours in is we train five hours once a week, every Monday. Uh, all five of the K-9 handlers will get together and we'll train together as a unit. We're also joined uh, twice a month by the Mebane Police Department. They have two K-9 handlers that come out and train with us. Twice a year we certify through the United States Police K-9 Association. That's to show proficiency in drug detection, obedience, agility, and article searches. We currently have five K-9 handlers that work for the Burlington Police Department. We have four patrol dogs that are what we call dual purpose dogs. It was like, good boy! Which means they're certified in both drug detection and uh, tracking. We have one handler that works for the Vice Narcotics Unit. His dog is what we call a single purpose dog, and he's a drug detection dog only. Good boy, good boy. So this is, uh, this is heroin, a little bit of heroin. He had no training whatsoever. He, he was from the pound, so I uh, got him in January. We certified in the middle of March, so it took us you know, roughly close to three months to getting certified. So not too long. Uh, it's just taking like persistence and training pretty much every day until he gets it. Gets the odors. I never aspired to be a canine officer, but uh, I'm not regretting my decision to be his. He's a good dog. So I'm standing here with Lieutenant Chris Smith. Lieutenant, how important is the canine unit to the Burlington Police Department? It's very important. The canine unit is, uh, is, is it's an extra tool in our tool belt and for uh, helping solve crimes. Hey, he's licking the handle right there. Find it. This is, uh, this is cocaine cocaine in the glove box. Good boy. When dealing with an a incident that happens, if a suspect was in the location and got away, what would your dog be able to do as far as that? So I get there on scene, I'm going to place my dog in a tracking harness, um, hook him up to a 15-foot lead. It's imperative that the officer that arrives on scene gets a good starting point for the last place that the witness or the victim saw the suspect. Once he notifies me the last place the suspect was seen, then I'll cast my dog in that area, and when he picks up on the scent, he's going to be in tracking. Anytime that somebody's running from a scene, they're stepping on grass, they're kicking up rocks, they're moving dirt, and when they're doing this, they're causing ground disturbance. When that happens, an odor is released from the ground. Um, their sense of smell is strong enough to where they can pick up on that odor. Also, when you're running or you're walking, you're having dead skin cells and um, clothing particles that are falling off your body. And they also use that to um, scent discriminate and make sure they're not starting to track someone else. Um, their sense of smell has been explained to me that if me and you walk into a room um, and your mom's cooking vegetable soup, we smell exactly that vegetable soup. But when uh, the dog walks in the room, they smell everything individually. They smell the potatoes, they smell the tomatoes, they smell the green beans, the carrots, they smell all that individually. And that just kind of shows how strong that sense of smell is to pick up on the odor that's being released from the ground, as well as the uh, dead skin cells that are falling off your body. What other activities do you do as far as K-9 that's outside of patrol? Uh, some of these uh, these guys are responsible for, they're also responsible for doing public demonstrations uh, and they do them weekly. They do them in school settings, they actually do them at the police department, they do them for the Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts. We get many requests from different public organizations uh, and it's a, it's a good tool for us to reach out in a good conversation piece to the community. So what do you take away from the, being the lieutenant of a canine? Uh, well it gives me a, a, a the ability to be involved in the dogs. I've always loved dogs. I was a handler myself about 17 years ago, and that was probably one of the best jobs I had an opportunity to do. 
And now that I get an opportunity to, to continue to be involved with the dogs and have some say so in things that and maybe in a different direction that uh, we could do better that we didn't have an opportunity to do when I was a handler. That was a great look back at 2018. I agree. Had a lot of fun in 2018. I look forward to 2019. What about you? Absolutely. We're <laughs> going to have some fun. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of Burlington Now. Until next time, keep up to date with everything going on in the city online at BurlingtonNC.gov or Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at BurlingtonNC.